Greetings, dear viewers. We are welcoming you on Alatra TV. My name is Anastasia and my co-hosts today are Jason and Marina. And we are interviewing amazing guest, the author, researcher, YouTube blogger, Matt Lacroix. Matt will talk about ancient civilizations, their past and our future. And even though we will talk about ancient history, you will see how this history is related to us. Matt, welcome to the show. We are so excited to have you here. Thank you so much. It, it's an honor to be on here with all of you. Um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Yes, welcome, Matt. Um, you know, we're all a big fan of your work. We follow you. Um, most of us here subscribe to your channel. Um, so we're going to start it off with a question of what brought you to this research and at what age did you start taking an interest um, in the archaeological past? Uh, if you can, would you share that with our audience, please? Sure, Jason. Um, as if people, you know, read some of the books that I've written over the last, um, since 2016, I released two books where I really talk about how the, the, year, the years that lead up to someone um, really coming into themselves and de deciding, determining who they're going to be depend on so many different factors. And for me, as, as a young man, I was very lucky to spend a lot of years just out hiking and spending time in the outdoors and having a family that had those kinds of values. So those values were really imparted within me and I became very connected to being outside in nature and loving just the, the earth and being part of such an incredible experience. And I always found it um, from a young age. Most kids actually, as I started to get older, beyond being a child, a lot of kids really didn't connect with me. Um, I was seen as a little bit of an outsider and sort of strange because I'd be, you know, just looking up and staring up into, into the sky or at night looking up in the stars and everybody else was sort of running around and doing, doing their own, having their own little worlds with each other. And I was, I was always distracted by all this immense cosmos and world around me. And I, I felt very isolated from others because most people I felt like really weren't sharing those inquisitive and imaginatory aspects of our, our, this, where we are and what we're part of. And so from an early age, I was always so inquisitive. I was researching as many things as I possibly could. I was fascinated by this world. I thought to myself, you know, here we are in these incredible ecosystems that are all balanced. And I wanted to learn about, you know, meteorology, astronomy, um, geology. I was, so I studied all kinds of different things way before I studied history. That came much later in my life. It was more after college that I started to look into ancient history, but because I, I feel like I had so many other pieces that I had been really looking into for so, for so long and questioning so many things around me, why I felt so isolated while so many others were acting a certain way with each other. And I was getting this perspective from the outside looking in because of all those things. And it, it gave me a way to reflect and, and look at things from, from like an, an outer awareness standpoint. And, and that's where I became, I, I feel like a person who started to ask questions about why things are the way they are and what is the nature of our reality and what is the truth about our past. And so after college, I started really, really looking at ancient history and certain things would pop up, pop up like reading Robert Temple's, you know, serious mystery about the Dogon in Africa with the serious star system. And then just basically rippling out from there, I became absolutely fascinated every single time there'd be some little piece, this little nugget of truth that would come out that would completely contradict what I'd been told. I, be, I almost became fascinated. Well, is there more? And of course, as many other, many people listening to this know, it, it's that term is often called a rabbit hole because once you start to have that moment where you question things and you say, okay, well now my eyes, my third eye is open and I'm going to look at things in a completely objective way. And I want to know the truth. And those people, like a lot of the people listening to this, their lives ch often change forever. Um, and many others that see that don't really understand what's going on in that person's life. But it's a, it's a, I, I feel like it's this awakening pursuit of truth. And that's really what, what has guided me to where I am today. 
Thank you, Matt. Um, Marina has a, another question for you. Yes, absolutely. I agree with you. Knowledge and wisdom that like truly can change our life, like for sure. I really understand your motivation. But I still have a question. How did your project and your research change you and your perception of reality? And uh, do you feel it is important for people to expand their knowledge base? Yeah, what, as I was looking into ancient history, I was reading a lot of ancient texts. I was reading a lot of Gnostic texts. I was reading a lot of Hermetic texts. I was reading a whole variety of different angles. Um, you know, Vedic text. I was trying to basically what I was coming up with and really realizing is when I would read all of these different texts from all these different civilizations, I saw that they were basically saying the same thing in just slightly different ways. And I picked up on that early on and I, I would take walks outside. Honestly, this was, it was one of the, to me, one of the things I attribute so much to really just putting things together. I would go outside on, on a beautiful day and just take a walk and sort of almost like talk to myself about like, well, okay, okay, so this is, you know, the, the Hindus say this and then, you know, the ancient, you know, the, the, the ancient Egyptians say this and I, I would try to piece things together and figure it out. And quickly, I started to understand things on an entirely different level and I was able to take that information and apply it into my, in, into my life and do things like starting to sit quietly and, and meditate, trying to clear my mind. I, I felt like it would be my due diligence to, if, if you, you know, it's one thing to learn about something and then write about it to teach others, but how can you do that if you don't directly experience it yourself and be able to have an, an accurate reflection of what it, what it entails. And it was, it was, it was a very difficult road for all those who are trying to read these ancient texts and connect them in a higher perspective. It's not easy. It's not simply about picking them up and reading them and saying, aha, it's really about breaking down these layers of, of our subconscious that have held us back from certain ways about viewing reality. And you have to first break those down and dissolve them before you can start to grow. And one of the examples I use often in my writing and when I talk on um, videos is that I feel like our place here as, as a, you know, a sentient conscious being, I feel like when we compare it to something that really is, is a great analogy to look at, it's like a sapling tree in a forest. And that represents the growth of consciousness. And if that sapling tree underneath a canopy of darkness and, and, and overgrowth, if it doesn't receive enough light and nourishment, it really will never grow. And I feel like that's how consciousness should be viewed is it's like watering this, a, a little sapling plant and giving it just what it needs. And if you do that, it's incredible this path that we can take and what we can achieve in one lifetime. And of course, as we can, we can get into talking about it, but I really don't think that this moment that we're in now is the only one that we've ever existed as. I do think that the, the ancient studies talking about reincarnation and how energy can never be destroyed and really gets into the heart of what we are rather than just being this physical mammal that's on this planet. Yes, Matt, I agree with you. And I really like that you mentioned that theory itself, it's not enough. If you would like to grow, you need to put it in practice. And this is very important understanding. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Yeah, that's really cool. And I really like how you talk about this, like that you take a piece of knowledge from Hindu, from different culture, and then you build like a whole puzzle of it. And we would like to ask you about the probably main area of your expertise about ancient civilizations. And you know that it's like really a lot of evidence were left in terms of the megalithic structures, different complexes, artifacts saying us that advanced civilizations once were existing on the earth. And what do you think all these artifacts and all these structures are revealing to us? What knowledge do they give to us? Yeah, you know, it's one thing to have these ancient texts because it's, it's very easy just to say, well, it's a fabrication, it's not real. And then people are like, oh, well, I don't, I guess I don't really know what to believe anymore. But when you look at these ancient structures that are left behind, that have survived thousands of years of turmoil and erosion and these events that have happened, 
they are like the glimpse basically into the past and they can't lie. Their secrets are exposed for everyone to see. And it just takes a certain kind of trained eye to be able to know what you're looking for because in this to start us out so people understand when we're taught this certain version of history, we're told that human civilization started roughly 6,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent and is a completely linear growth until we are, until what we are now. So, meaning if anything was more advanced, it would have to have been built later. And so automatically this perception is, so anything that we see, these ruins, any of these structures around the world, they're all the same age. There's no differentiation in the different cultures that have been there. That's what, that's what we're essentially told. This is, that's what we're given. And so a lot of people, they'll go visit, you know, they'll go down to South America and they'll visit Machu Picchu or they'll visit outside Cusco or Alete Tambo, or, you know, they'll head over into Bolivia next to Lake Titicaca and they'll visit, you know, Tiwanaku or Puma Punku. And they'll see these structures and they'll say, okay, this is the Inca that built these and then case closed. And then they'll go home and be like, yeah, it was beautiful. Look at these, look at these pictures I have, but that's the, usually the end of the story. But for, for others, and I have to give a lot of credit to someone who I just had a fantastic conversation with recently, a great hero of truth of mine, Brian Forster, who I feel like is, is like the megalithic Indiana Jones of our age. He realized very early on with a lot of others noticing as well, like Graham Hancock and Robert Schock and Robert Raval and a lot of others. But, but I, these, these individuals, these experts came along and they noticed that, hey, there's a completely different style of architecture and building on the bottom most layers. In most cases, in some cases, um, I should say, in some cases, like in Africa and in places in Egypt, like the Osirion, it's actually built below ground. And so there are these incredibly sophisticated structures built on these lower levels. And then above them is more primitive building with use, the use of mortar in a very simple building. And when you know what to look for, it's very easy to tell the difference. And maybe that's just because it's something that I've had an interest in for a very long time. And I also looked at things like geology and, and stonemason building. But once you start to know what to look for, you find that this isn't just these isolated events around the world. These megalithic advanced structures left behind are actually scattered all over the world from North and South America, all the way across the ocean to, you know, Egypt and around the Mediterranean ocean and across into places like Angkor Wat and even into Japan. Um, some people might not, not know, but the same principle applies in the Imperial wall of Japan these, the, the, the main structure is built around an ancient section of wall that is from the same time period that we talk about. And that, and what, like what's showing on the screen, like in Machu Picchu with those stone structures, they're all built with this precision technology and sophistication that in some ways we can't even replicate, replicate with our technology and tools today. And what do, what does it, honestly, what does it say, right? You were asking, what does it tell us? Well, Based on the precision of the building and the way that they aligned these structures to true magnetic north and south and the way that they were built with certain types of um, rock, basically quartz rich rock, all of these different components come in to tell us that they were most likely built for an energetic reason. And we can get into that as we go along, but it takes you down this fa fabulous rabbit hole of, well, instead of thinking of ancient civilizations as just being, you know, five or 6,000 years old, some of these structures are well over 10 or 12,000 years old, leading us into completely different lost civilizations that have entire stories written down of their epics and what they've gone through and even the story of where mankind came from. Yeah, that's really interesting. And like when you're talking about these things, like uh, the people building not just these structures, not just for living, or cult purposes that it they have an energetic purpose that's really amazing and it's telling to me that they were more advanced and i think jason has a really interesting question about <laughs> about the, these civilizations also you know matt that was a great overview i know it's it's pretty difficult to reduce this into a concise format when you talk about something so expansive 
and covers such a vast amount of our history. Um, based upon your findings and research, um, what have you discovered was the fate of these ancient civilizations and or their destiny? And a second part to that question is, where would you recommend to the audience that's watching this today uh, to start to learn about the myths and legends so that they can enter that rabbit hole and learn more? Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> well, the, the first question is rather complex. Um, and it's probably, I think it's going to be something that we're going to be covering also later on as well. But I can at least give um, an analysis of an overview, like you, like you were saying, of what happened. It looks like um, when we look at our past, when we look at these structures and the evidence that's left behind on the state that they're in, and we look at a combination of different things from ice core samples from Greenland, giving us a, a snapshot of um, what our, the climate of our, of our world was like more than 20,000 years ago, we start to put this picture together of, of what has happened in the past. I mean, like I gave the bold statement before that others have obviously given as well saying that these ancient megalithic civilizations are, they predate what we think of as the last ice age. That's 12,000 years ago. Now, something I always mention, but I, I have to mention it because it's absolutely mind boggling for even me to still perceive, but you know, where I'm sitting right now talking to you in Maine during that time period of the, la or the last ice age, you know, 10 to 12,000 years ago, there was one to two miles of ice above my head. So it would have been, if you were to come here, you would have been on top of one of these like Antarctica like glaciers. And there was known as the Laurentide ice sheet. And it was covering the entire Northern half and the Southern half of our world. And so I wouldn't even been able to talk to you here. I would have been, um, this area would have been, you know, under billions of pounds of ice crushing the surface of the planet. So there's no megalithic structures anywhere where I am living right now. And I understand that because there was ice here. And that's how we have to start wrapping our heads around is understanding where to place these different ancient civilizations based on the evidence and, and how to understand, well, what was our world like back then? And what it was like was we had enormous amounts of ice built up on, on the, around the Northern and Southern hemisphere. Like I mentioned, think about this aspect. We have the same amount of water roughly that we've had on the earth for hundreds of thousands of years or more. If you have miles of ice covering the massive amounts of area, much, much larger than today, you, that water would be locked up in ice and they wouldn't be available in the oceans. And so therefore, ocean levels were 400 feet lower back during this time period of these ancient civilizations. And like today, if you were to say, look, around, look at a map around the world, the majority of the major cities around the world are built along the coast because it's the most logical way to move goods back and forth and to travel. And it's also tends to be a more hospitable place because of climate to live near the coast. So therefore, look at today, whatever we have left of these ancient civilizations, the majority of them are probably lost underneath oceans right now. And that's exactly what we saw during some of these past tsunami events. Um, like back in the, the last tsunami that hit in, I think it was 2002 or 2006, um, we, when the, the tides receded off of India and they were flying choppers in to go help people as, as the tsunami was, was, was occurring, they saw ancient structures under the ocean off of India. And, and today, in so many different places of India, like Bar Bar Hill Caves and Alora Caves and all these incredible carved out mountain structures out of solid basalt, we find lost civilizations there. And then we also see them under the ocean. That tells us concise proof that they were built before ocean levels were 400 feet higher. And when did that happen? Well, essentially, we had a disastrous um, event occur that led to not the ice age melting slowly and receding, but completely collapsing. And we find geologic evidence all across North, Amer North America showing enormous mountainsides that have turned into ancient river channels and gorges that have been carved out all around um, North America off the ocean, where the um, off of the coast, as well as in Western areas. And it shows us that there were these disastrous events that occurred that melted all this ice and 
when we look at ancient texts from, from nearly every culture around the world that is considered ancient and has roots back to more pre 5,000 years ago, every single one of them talks about a great flood, a great disaster that wiped out everything and everything. And most civilizations had to start over again. And that's exactly what we find that there was a combination of very disastrous events that occurred on the earth which led to the destruction of advanced civilizations, not in a way that I think that we would think of with modern day helicopters and planes, but in an advanced state of understanding incredible building structures to harness or balance energy of the earth and, and also be connected to the cosmos themselves. And, you know, when we look at our, our world today, which we can, we're going to get into and discuss in a very materialistic and empty fashion where we care little about, energy and balance in the cosmos and we're so focused on material wealth and gain and all of these things that have been perpetuated you really can see that it, these cycles tend um, these cycles occur in civilizations just as the maya maya predicted so to answer just to conclude what i was saying these these disasters these events led to a combination of different things to affect on to affect the earth from ocean currents changing to um, ice ages m rapidly melting with mass extinctions to grand solar maximums occurring with er and minimums where our sun causing coronal mass ejections and these solar flares to basically hit certain parts of the earth and melt some of these structures. I mean, it is completely apocalyptic when you start to get into some of the geologic and ancient evidence about what happened to our ancient um, ancestors. Thank you, Matt. Yes, uh, it's it's quite obvious when you expand uh, your uh, educational gaps, right, and look at things holistically. You you can see that what you're saying is true. If there's ancient structures below the water, and you take the ice core samples, you can see obviously and clearly that there were pre civilizations or more advanced civilizations at the time when there was no water there. And then in the second part, as as we you know, as of 2014, um, scientists are conjecturing right now that there possibly may be as much water as above the Earth's surface below it. And, you know, one of, one of the funny questions I, I like to ask myself is, well, where did all this water go? You know, <laughs> where did it go? It, it's not simply precipitation, you know. And uh, so you, you've given us a lot to think about in the audience, a lot to think about. And I would also like to comment how you're always humble and you mentioned the people that have influenced you and have led you to reading more like Brian Forrester or Gerald Clark or, uh, you know, your friend Billy Carson or even Rex. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce Lisa to you. Lisa's going to ask you a few questions. She's from Moscow and she's a, a geological geophysicist. And so uh, she's going to talk with you about cataclysms and things like that. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much for this live broadcast. I really enjoy it. And I have a few questions. Uh, as you mentioned before, as you said before, all, a lot of evidence has been found that entire civilizations were wiped off from the surface on Earth uh, by a giant tsunami. And uh, also, it is very interesting what is about um, maybe volcanoes or seismic activities. And also, what, uh, what is your opinion? Could you please indicate some of the most significant artifacts that prove those catastrophic events above the sea level, which uh, this now above the sea level? So thank you. Sure. Yeah, great question. Um, what, we've, yeah, what we find, like I was saying, is that because our, our earth is based on a balance of the North and South pole with this electromagnetic magnetic grid, when we find these events of the sun and other various effects as well, the sun going through grand solar maximums to minimums and vice versa, this cycle that seems like it's about 12, every, every 12,000 years, it affects the, the electromagnetic grid, the poles of our planet. And when those become disrupted, you can get what's called a pole shift or a, like a pole wobble. And, they're, and they're, it's important to know the difference because if the poles decide to just shift and radically move to an entirely different direction, it tends to cause complete chaos on the planet. 
the tectonic plates of our earth can have the potential to radically move and cause magma to explode and earthquakes and tsunamis like you mentioned and so when we when we look at these ancient stories from like you know plato talking in the timius and critias about atlantis being swallowed up by the sea in a in a very short period of time it really starts to correlate when we look at this geologic evidence of these civilizations and my my favorite piece of evidence i think of all for just really explaining the, the, at least one aspect of this event in a very detailed order is what's known as an ancient cuneiform tablet called the Atrahasis. Now, for those who don't know what that means, in Mesopotamia, the area today known as Iraq, you know, we are taught that the first civilization around 6,000 years old was, came about in the Fertile Crescent of Iraq. I do believe that that's true. But the time frame we're given, I think, is completely wrong. What you showed me, a timeline that I've, I've been working on for a long time recently. And in that timeline, I realized that it's very difficult to place all these different events. And so I found very quickly that what we think of as the ancient Sumerians or the Assyrians or the Hittites, they all had these different, slightly different time periods that they had, as well as different epics of the same civilizations trying to rebuild again. So it wasn't simply that I was looking at the Sumerians. It seemed that there was a pre-Sumerians as well. And what that means is a pre-cataclysmic -ca pre Sumerians. And the way we know that is because in their ancient writings, like the Atrahasis, which was found in an ancient library, far more important in my mind than even the Library of Alexandria, which was known as the Ashurbanipal Library, which was found in 1849 by a man named Austin Henry Laird. And he found this massive library buried of what's known as a cuneiform tablet. Now, for those who aren't aware what a cuneiform tablet is, it is the most ancient text we have without a doubt, because if you had any other form of writing, it wouldn't have been able to survive. Simple as case closed. That's how, that's how this works. They, the Sumerians realized and the Akkadians that if you took clay and you etched in complex messages, sometimes even symbols, you could then bake those clay tablets and they would survive for 10, 20, maybe 30, 40, maybe 50,000 years or more because it was like a perfect preservation indenting these, these messages within the clay so that if the outer surface started to erode, that message was still embedded within those, those tablets. And that was the most brilliant way that you could leave a message behind because paper would dissolve and disappear. Even writings on cave walls and other forms of art and, and writing would disappear. They would not survive the age of time. And so what we find with, it wasn't just a few of these tablets were found. There was more than 30,000 cuneiform tablets found in this one library alone because King Ashurbanipal in one of these ancient ancient epics that I mentioned, early, actually early on, around 4,000 um, 4, years ago, he realized the importance of these stories and he went out and amassed this entire library by going out to find where all these tablets were. And when, what he said in his writings was that they were already ancient during his time, which is absolutely mind blowing to, to wrap your head around that here we have a figure, Ashurbanipal, who was supposedly the one who wrote them and he's saying that when he went to go find them, they were already ancient. It means that these stories go back far longer than we've been told. And what they say in some of them, for instance, when George Smith in the late 1800s translated the Atrahasis and the Epic, Epic of Gilgamesh and many others, he realized that it wasn't just these stories that were old, you know, talking about maybe society and laws and rules in, in a perspective of the past, which is very important, but it was on a completely different level. It was talking about these epics and these incredible kings and these stories of these royal bloodline kings that survived these cataclysms because they were warned that they were coming. And it, it gets into, it parallels later on biblical stories that then s borrowed these earlier stories and rewrote them. So what we find is that these stories often um, relate to stories that we're familiar with, like this, this story of Noah that we hear in the modern Bible. Well, if you read the Atrahasis, this ancient king of Sharupak, one of his, one of his 
main stories is revolving around this disastrous deluge in which he was warned he had to build some kind of a craft to survive it because there was basically like a tsunami, like was what was mentioned. And they, the only way to survive in these events was to create some kind of a structure. And that is, was carried down in these messages in detailed accounts about how after these events occurred, most people were wiped out and only in a few were, only a few were left and they had to re basically repopulate and restart civilizations. And so that's the kind of perspective that we see when we look at these, we take, okay, megalithic structures are built in a sophistication that is part of this lost civilization technologies that they had and, and the knowledge that they knew. So we, we know that. Then we have these ancient writings that predate these disasters of the Younger Dryas, the last ice age. So check, we know that that's also proof that they're earlier, as well as the fact that they specifically mention certain cities that were around before these floods that were completely destroyed. And so you get this complete picture of the ancient past that goes back well over 12,000 years ago that basically just that what it goes into um, in these stories, it says that these cataclysms are, were so severe that most of the knowledge that had been accumulated was lost. And that's why the building that's the, the more primitive building that is on top of these structures, especially in places like Machu Picchu and in Egypt is so primitive on top is because they just didn't have the knowledge that, that was once present to them. And so they were trying to mimic them and they were largely unsuccessful. Thank you so much for your answer. And uh, also, as I understood, you said that uh, cataclysms has a cyclic nature. So it occurred each 12,000 uh, years. And so the last one was uh, 12 years ago. And as you said, younger Dias, um, ice uh, age. So uh, what is your opinion, just in sure, on the current climate changes on the planet? Do you think it is caused by human? I mean, are the cataclysms on the Earth caused, caused by anthropogenic factor or by some other processes, which, sure. which we have now? <laughs> Yeah, great question. Yeah, here you know, here we are reading about these stories of these these civilizations that were destroyed by these cataclysms. And then I, I know, of course, as we go along, I can absolutely get into you know some of the structures like Gobekli Tepe that prove the purpose of what they were really looking for to do with their technology and their and their knowledge. But what what we essentially find is that these these types of cycles they understood them they knew how to anticipate them occurring. And so that was why they would align these temples, you know, true north and south, and to basically have this map of the cosmos. That was what the purpose of Gobekli Tepe in the Anatolia region of Turkey is. It's an astronomical temple. And that can be found all around the ancient world where the, the people there knew these stories of their ancestors. And they knew that these events were gonna happen. So what do they do? They're not like mapping today's time just to know when to go water the crops. They're mapping the heavens to know when the next disaster is coming. And so when they when that happens, they're they then build these underground cities to survive. Go look into Darren Kuyu just happens to be right next to Gobekli Tepe in Turkey in the Cappadocia region. And there's this massive underground city that was built that could house more than 20,000 people. Why would you want to live underground unless the events that were going on the surface were so hostile that that was the only place you could survive? And we find ancient cave systems with people living underground and, and protected all around the world. And what it tells us is that the ancient people knew that when these cycles happen, they can often come with great destruction. And so today, um, when we look at our world and we look at how it was just told by the National Weather Service here where I live in Maine that this is the hottest summer ever recorded well in since records began, which is which is a very small time window to look at. But when you have year after year after year breaking records in this time frame, it shows you, ah, OK, so, well, what do we see on the world right now in, in the state we're in? Glaciers around the Earth 
in the in the north and south poles and in mountain glaciers are almost all receding okay and at the same time the inuit of the uh, the northern canada areas who have hunted from the stars within the last 20 years have noticed that the stars have shifted okay so there's another piece of it what that means is that the north pole is wobbling it's moving and if you if people have seen over the last week, there have been multiple stories and w within the last few years, just these story after story about how NASA and um, a lot of other government organizations are having to fly up to the North Pole because they're not able to have accurate readings anymore to, to have guidance because the North Pole is shifting so much. They're having to go up and remap it again. And so at the same time, what's happening? There are more volcanoes and earthquakes going off right now on Earth than there's been in hundreds of years. And storms are all erratic, you know, and what's the narrative? Human beings are entirely to blame and it's, it's because of us and look at the state we're in. But hey, if we're really careful, we can prevent this from getting any worse. And, you know, everybody just go back to what you're doing. You know, nothing to see here is besides the fact that, you know, it seems like there's all these warning signs just bombarding us from all directions. And what does that mean? Well, Every 12,000 years, the sun goes through these periods of time when the inner nucleus of energy within itself goes through these flare up events. And that just, and everything's always about this balance cycle in, in the cosmos. Everything follows that, where it, it flares up and gets hot, and then it goes through a period where it gets cool. And that's known as a grand solar maximum to a grand solar minimum, and then continuing that. That's how it works. So what happens? Well, glaciers, when it gets really hot, the temperatures on the earth all spike, the glaciers mostly melt. And when that happens, and a lot of people might not know this, but a lot, what, what happens is the fresh water melts and goes into the ocean. Fresh water is much less dense than salt water. So the salt water will sink and the fresh water will float on top. And the, one of the biggest factors that controls the weather of our planet is not necessarily the sun but the ocean currents the oceans they were some of you are are talking to and and in, in, uh, in this call right now from places like europe if you're in places um, from spain and france up into scandinavia and all across those areas you're living in a climate that really isn't supposed to be that warm it's because of what's known as the gulf stream that brings up warm, hot air from the equator and brings it into that area and makes it so that places like that are hospitable. If, if they didn't have that current, they would be much, much colder than they are now. That's shown in some various movies that have been shown in the past. So every, every cycle, the same thing happens. The, the glaciers recede, they fill the water with fresh water, the ocean currents shut down. Then you go back to a cold climate on the earth. The sun goes into a solar minimum and gets weaker and then you go into an ice age and then that cycle just repeats itself that's why there's no ancient structures across the entire northern most hemisphere because they wouldn't have been able to survive longer than that cycle so where are they built they're all built right in the center of the earth from egypt right up into turkey right into south america in the jungles and into peru they're all built in that corridor and all the megafauna that were existing in the last ice age, woolly mammoths and saber tooth tigers, they were all killed during that event, which tells you that even these incredible animals, these megafauna animals couldn't survive. That's how serious of an event this was. They found woolly mammoths up in Northern Siberia that were encased in ice and preserved that had food still undigested in their bellies. These events were very, very fast and they were very, very um, climatic. They were very powerful. And these ancient civilizations knew that. And because their, their ancestors had been wiped out, it was like this preparation of knowledge handed down to try to survive these cycles. Because if, and this is getting back to where we are now in that long-winded answer, but if a culture, a civilization can survive those cycles, they can potentially reach one or two things. They can either reach the cosmos and become an incredibly enlightened being that's balanced with the earth that can go into almost infinite possibilities of the future, or they can destroy themselves through destroying their environment, their climate, and basically destroying themselves with war. 
And we're in this time period where not only are those huge factors, but we're going through one of those cycles right now. And that's why there's so much news talking about these weird dents in the magnetic field that were just reported down off South America and these anomalies with the North Pole wobbling around. We're seeing a pole wobble right now, but not necessarily a pole shift. And the ultimate question is, are we going to see a full pole shift? Or, and this is my own personal opinion, that all the secrecy that if, if you really look into some of the technology that supposedly came out after World War II, all the secrecy in the North and South Pole that's been going on, in Antarctica and the North Pole, like Admiral Byrd talking about some of those odd reports, I do believe that this has been known for a long time, and there's a, a very organized attempt to try to prevent this pole shift right now. And that's in my opinion in a very, very, um, seems very obvious to me, someone who's studied meteorology and climatology for, for many years. In fact, that was something I almost wanted to go in as a profession. But seeing what, is no, what are known as SAIs or more commonly known as chemtrails, the entire purpose of that program is not only to convince people that they're just simply contrails, but to hide the fact that these events are going on right now. And those are the means that is going on all around us to try to prevent us from going through a complete um, cataclysmic disaster with this, with this time period. Thank you so much, Matt, for your answers. And also, it is, it is great. Your uh, knowledge in geology are very deep and your answers are very, um, it's great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. This is a very important information. I really would like that people around the world will know and understand that right now our like we have a very serious situation. So we really need to learn and take those uh, helping hand from our ancestors that lived for us, those evidence that we can understand about cycles, about what like um or what will um, happen to our civilization pretty soon. So thank you, Matt, for sharing that with us. Absolutely. Yes, Matt, thank you for those answers. You answered a couple of uh, questions I was going to ask, uh, whether or not we are currently uh, living in a processional cycle as uh, determined by our ancestors. And to kind of back up what you said, um, we won't get into uh, the, the tinfoil hat as most people uh, are labeled who don't follow uh, mainstream, okay? Uh, but what we do know is that uh, Mars, for example, is being extensively studied and that uh, during the last ice age, Mars actually had its own ice age that followed these processional cycles. And if we look throughout the cosmos, there's many planets right now whose volcanoes, ice volcanoes, and what we know as you know regular volcanoes are taking place all throughout the cosmos. So there's definitely evidence that uh, there's a processional uh, cycle to our universe and the cosmos itself, and it affects uh, all people within it. Um, I'm going to ask you, uh, could you, if our audience is interested, could you point them in the direction of any megalithic structures or artifacts, uh, if they're interested in it, to determine for themselves uh, the evidence of these cycles that we are talking about, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the ones that comes to mind that I would love people to check out is um, you go into the ancient city of today, which is known as Luxor, Egypt, you find these massive megalithic statues called the Colossi of Memnon. And they're these incredible, you know, 60 foot tall, you know, over 100 ton statues that are facing um, the, the entrance to this great kingdom. Uh, what makes that important is not only are those structures made out of a single stone each that was carved into those incredible things, but how would a culture, first of all, even have been able to move those in the time frame that we're told? When you start to realize that, okay, so that's part of the lost civilizations, that's not part of what we think of as the, the dynastic pharaohs of Egypt. The evidence for that is when you, these structures, when you walk around them and you analyze them, you find that on the northeast corner of both of these massive statues is this marking structure on the stone itself called this known as vitrification. And it means that the quartz in the rock is melted. And it's, it's not from erosion over time. It's from some extreme event 
that literally melted the rock itself. Meanwhile, when you go to a lot of these other structures around the world, especially in places in South America, um, when you go and you look at places in, in Chichen Itza and um, Tiwanaku, you see that these structures have burning and weathering on one side and they're strewn in a certain direction. That's shown extensively well throughout Egypt, in South America, in the Americas, up into the Aztec and Maya. You see the same thing on some, on some of the structures. And what it tells us is that those structures were melted and burned by heat that was so extreme that human beings would have never been able to be around those structures. It would have, you would have literally vaporized. And I think that that's the real need for these underground cave systems to, to have to seek shelter. And why did that happen? Jason brought it up. The reason that these astronomical temples are mapping the cosmos is that they're mapping these cycles based on what's known as the precession of the equinoxes. And what that means is that the earth goes through this period of where it wobbles on its poles and it faces a different direction. And those wobbles coincide with different ages, known as the zodiac ages. And those zodiac ages are how they determine when these certain events are going to occur and they can take steps to prepare them. In some cases, like Gobekli Tepe, they deliberately buried the site to preserve and protect it because they knew what was coming. And I, th I find that to be just inc completely incredible to, to perceive that. So anyway, these structures around the world exhibit this, um, this evidence on them that shows that they were completely destroyed in some cases and strewn all over the place. And then another culture came later. Some, some, in some cases, they tried to put them back together. But in other cases, they literally built temples around them. That's how important they recognized that they were. And... I feel like if people start to go really look throughout Egypt, most of the structures like around the Sphinx, um, around the Os Osirion, um, down into Karnak, Karnak has fantastic examples of this burning on the outer rock facing a certain direction. And just like I was saying, pointing out these megalithic precise building of this, of this stone. And there's one way we can prove to know that it wasn't from the culture that, that we've told, been told. Look at the, Egypt, for example. When you go to a place like Karnak, Karnak, you find hieroglyphics on these incredible monolith, monoliths, okay, that stretch up into the sky and there's all kinds of ancient writing on them. The, someone would, might jump to the assumption, the assumption that that means that that writing that's on there means that they built them. But that's not really the case because a lot of those structures that are built are built out of a type of granite that is, and just types of rock that are so hard that they would have been impossible to carve with Bronze Age tools. So when we're told and given this timeline of when they were, all these cultures built them, like the dynastic Egyptians, the technology, according to the Mohs hardness scale, which puts things up against itself based on their density and hardness, it shows us that a certain tool and sophistication would have been required to be able to create these sophisticated structures in, to the point where, as I pointed out, some of them are so sophisticated that we couldn't even do that today. That, like the Great Pyramid of Giza, being built in such a way where it's perfectly aligned with the king and queen's chambers pointing towards or, you know, the constellations of Orion and Sirius, this almost feminine and masculine aspect of the cosmos possibly even going into reincarnation and rebirth and cycles of energy and consciousness. These cultures understood those things and they built in these structures all over the earth on very specific points called ley lines where energy was coming together in um, this intersection point. And so we're, you know, when we look at these structures to me, it is absolutely mind blowing to think that was built more than 12,000 years ago with technology that we don't even have today. And that's what really makes me so passionate about talking about these cycles and these lost civilizations and even about the influences of where that knowledge came from and leading all leading back to who we really are and what our place is in the cosmos. Thank you, Matt. I couldn't have said it better. I really appreciate your well-articulated answers there. Thank you. Um, Marina, do you have a question for us? Yes, yes. Um, it's really understand who we truly are and act accordingly. 
And unfortunately, right now, if we would open that textbook, that world history textbook, we will see that our history started 6,000 years ago, and that was the history of violence and destruction. But when, we, when I was listening to all this interesting fact about previous civilization, and hard to believe for me, so that people were that aggressive that our textbooks telling me, telling us, do we have information on the cultures or civilization who lived peacefully and were living in the time period of 12,000 to 6,000 years? Do we have maybe any examples when society was living without wars, competition, violence, slavery, truly are, and act accordingly? And unfortunately, right now, if we would open that textbook, the world history textbook, we will see that our history started 6,000 years ago, and that was the history of violence and destruction. But when, we, when I was listening to all this interesting fact about previous civilization, and hard to believe for me, so that people were that aggressive that our textbooks telling me, telling us, do we have information on the cultures or civilization who lived peacefully and were living in the time period of 12,000 to 6,000 years? Do we have maybe any examples when society was living without wars, competition, violence, slavery? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and what you really find is that there were wars in pre-12,000 history, your history, but that was escalated on a massive scale when after the reset occurred. The reset occurred with this last cataclysm during this time period known as the Younger Dryas. When that event finally subsided and the climate became hospitable again, we had these cultures and civilizations rise up. And we know that from another very important cuneiform tablet called the Legend of Atana. Now, in that tablet from Mesopotamia, the Tana states that he was the first chosen bloodline king, royal king, to rule in the new world. And what he specifically says was that he was part of what was known as the new beginning of essentially humanity. They were, he was tasked as a king to create civilization in the certain image that it was supposed to be created. And he states in there that the first city that had been built after these destructive events occurred was known as the city of Kish. And today you can go and find remnants of that city in Iraq right now. It's, it's there in, in ruins and it's right in that tablet. But wait a minute, aren't those tablets considered by experts just be myth? And there's nothing in there that actually connects to ancient history. It's just people putting together this time, you know, from four or 5,000 years ago, putting these cities in there and talking about all these events, but they're being metaphorical and they're not being truthful. But he specifically states that Kish is the first city created after the deluge. And then we go into something like Atrahasis, like I had mentioned before, and they state that Shrupak was the last city before the deluge. Seems very specific when you, when you start to go in and study it, that there were cities that were pre-cataclysmic and then cities that were post. And those rules and laws that were then enacted were in some ways similar, but then became um, very corrupted. Our history is full of violence and bloodshed during this time period of Pisces. And these ages last roughly 2,100 years. And they seem to have um, a certain kind of polarity that rules them. And it gets back into a lot of these ancient texts that goes really deep into even our what we can accept as being real in reality, but it, it's, it's far more complex than what we think of as total randomness. Um, it, it's basically based on cycles of human civilization rising and falling um, for a variety of reasons. And you can see that in places in, in like the Mayan kingdom, like in Kuku Khan's temple, every step on that temple pyramid represented a different level of consciousness. So we essentially fell into a lower state of consciousness because we lost all this knowledge and we became largely warlike and empires be became to dominate the world and much of the ancient knowledge was sought out and destroyed 
And so right now what we're, what we're faced with is basically picking up these pieces of the past to try to understand what came before us. And what they state is that there was an age before these cataclysms of the younger Dryas that was known as the golden age. And it was supposedly this time period when great civilization of Atlantis was around, connected by all these other civilizations all around the world. And they built these incredible structures. And what you can see from what was left behind is evidence of, of what their mentality was. Let me give you an example. Let's say we do get destroyed by these events. What would they find from us if ten, five, six, that, seven thousand years went by? What, what would be left from us today? Well, the steel and all the metal would just disappear eventually. And some of the some of the structures we built, maybe some of the old time masons in some cities would survive, but maybe plastic, right? They probably would find a bunch of plastic and think of as and be like, okay, that's so that's civilization was built on just taking resources and creating empires and being warlike. Whereas the previous civilizations that left, left behind these incredible precise structures aligned with certain energy uh, locations of the earth, that tells you what their mentality was right there. They weren't focused on material wealth and goods. They were focused on the acquisition of knowledge and raising their consciousness and awareness to becoming like these beings of the cosmos. And I think that's why so many of these structures are aligned to all the specific positions that they are and had this knowledge that really goes far beyond what we did because the principles that made their civilization what they were are not the same principles that we have today. And I think that we can learn a tremendous about, amount about those civilizations and have those direct lessons apply to where we are and where we're going. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your answer. Jason, I think you wanted to ask something. Apologies, about I found some interesting information while you were talking with us about these civilizations. Um, so Matt, you have discussed uh, Mesopotamian uh, civilizations and cultures at great length uh, on your channel and in your book and everything else. Who do you think is responsible for writing our history in such a way and that it opens up to Sumer? Because uh, a person doesn't have to venture far. They can find that uh, pre-Sumerian, there were cultures and civilizations that uh, lived or what's called as farming cultures, right? But they lived in peace. Uh, and currently today's evidence shows that they traded and they traded peacefully. However, there's this uh, drastic time period in Sumeria where all of a sudden we have dynasties appearing. Uh, we have hierarchies appearing. Um, what do you think the purpose of not sharing both sides of our history is uh, as far as academics goes and history uh, books go? Yeah, this this glimpse of what we were like in the past as you know nomadic hunter gatherers that just slowly became what we are today. I really do feel like it, it falls under this what's largely like a Darwinian viewpoint of our past, you know, the fact that we're just evolved apes and that we came here in a in almost a random way as a, as a survival of the fittest mentality, right? We got here because we triumphed over our world. And here we are based on just the knowledge that people got from somewhere and then had these ideas that came from somewhere and then they created all this stuff and here we are. That's what we're, we're made to believe. Whereas that's not what these tablets and these texts say at all. It states that they were given this knowledge from above and that they were they were given like a blueprint for how to create human civilizations. Even something like you said, farming and agriculture, that may seem like a primitive thing. Like, you know, someone drives out in the countryside and they just see farms everywhere. They're like, boy, this is really rural and primitive. But no, that's the complete opposite. One of the building blocks of a civilization is the necessity of having a agricultural system that's robust enough to feed and, and grow that population in a sustainable way. So the Sumerians, one of the first forms of currency they had that we have evidence for was called a shekel. And it was based on the value of a bushel of wheat. It shows you that that culture was basing their currency and their belief system and how they structured everything on an actual good that they were producing, which was important. 
Whereas now we have a fiat currency that's not really based on that type of system anymore. More and more so, like you said, connecting back to what you were, you were talking about. When we look at these ancient texts and the, the mentalities that were held by them, and then we look at what happened, we see that there's this very important moment in history when all of this information was put into a certain compartment and labeled in a certain way where a lot of it was blocked from us, our awareness. And what, what I mean by that is the Roman empire is one of the, the, the largest empires in the history, if not the largest. And they, when they were collapsing as a military empire, there was a brilliant idea that um, the leader Constantine had where he, he decided where, Hey, what if we become the Holy Roman Empire. And so when the city of Constantinople was, was founded in, in what's now, now modern day Turkey, they conform, they changed the Roman Empire from being a military empire into being the Holy Roman Empire, which means that they were going to become a Christian empire that had certain values. So, you know, what does that matter? Well, they took a lot of these ancient texts and they rewrote them and they controlled certain pieces of information. They left other pieces of information out. For instance, an, an ancient Hebrew writing that was found um, alongside a lot of these other texts that became what we think of as the modern Bible was known as the Book of Enoch. But that, because of that text and what it contains in it, it was held out of our modern Bible because it contained all of these things talking about watchers and Nephilim giants and all of these fallen angels and all these terms that just did not fall in this certain aligned viewpoint of history. And what happened was the Holy, Ro Holy Roman Empire started persecuting people for having certain beliefs and burning any ancient text, such as the Great Library of Alexandria, right to the ground and going around and destroying all of the evidence of these pre-Abrahamic religions and what the knowledge that they, they contained had. And, they, and basically today, we're, we have this version of history that is very, very controlled, that derives from what I believe of as from that time period, as well as a religious and spiritual perspective that came out of that time period as well. It was a double, double type of way to control um, our reality, control spirituality slash religion, the message, and control um, basically the viewpoint of ancient history and what defines us. And that doesn't mean it's necessarily always a Darwinian point of view, but it's not uh, a point of view that tends to be about full creativity and, and, and free will. It seems tends to be a more constrained view about control, a more controlled point of view. And so we are now rediscovering things like the 42 laws of Mat out of ancient Egypt and the seven hermetic prim principles of Thoth out of Egypt. This ancient knowledge that tells us no, this is how civilizations were supposed to be designed in a way where it creates a certain kind of society, whereas we have largely abandoned most of those qualities to get to the state that we're in today. Matt, that is really great Thank you point. so much. Yeah, I really enjoyed your answer. And, you know, like I have a short question that, I don't know, we tend to believe that human nature is based on a conflicts and destruction but what do you think where we would be today if we all would know that truly human nature it is based on peace on cooperation on collaboration and if that knowledge would be translated everywhere yeah that's something that i talk about a lot because it really comes down to how do we perceive ourselves on earth and in the cosmos you know, are we just an, a, 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 an ape that's evolved to a certain place? Are we um, just a lucky side of evolution? Or, or are we this being that is eternal, that has consciousness that, you know, resides outside of the third dimensional physical world? You know, what defines us? What, what is our true nature? Are we violent as, a, as the inherent true nature of us? And then we have to overcome that violence or... Have we been driven to that violence through systematic years and years and years of just being fed this certain perspective and, and, and chaotic reality where we almost feel like that's what we are and, 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 and almost kept in that state? I wrestled with that question for, for a long time. 
it was always driven into me in school that we were the species of violence that had to adapt and overcome from that violence. But my perspective started to change when I actually read a lot of the ancient texts and I started to read into how they defined us on an energetic level, consciousness and, you know, the state of what makes us a human being. When you look at the properties that we have, we have an incredibly deeply emotional, emotional love side of us that has the ability to become incredibly powerful and really um, define almost all of our actions through the actions of uh, a loving, emotional, positive side. However, at the same, in the same way, we can also be something completely the opposite. I give so one of the examples that analogies that I often use is with a, like a, sm, like a small dog. If you had a small dog, you know, that dog was, was born and it was at that point rather neutral. It hadn't really had any influences from anything yet. It was young. And you, you had two families that took that dog in a hypothetical situation, right? One of the families that could take that dog was um, just very, very cruel. And they beat that dog all the time. They hurt it. And they didn't give it any kind of positive reinforcement energy or anything. That dog is going to turn into a violent dog. It's going to be this side of itself that is lacks really any emotion because that emotion was beaten out of it. And it's just going to be a really awful viewpoint of what a dog represents. Whereas hypothetically, another family takes that dog and they're an incredibly loving family that takes that dog on beautiful walks out on open fields in the sunshine and they give it lots of love and food and that dog turns in the most beautiful loving dog you've ever seen well which state did that dog belong in did it belong in that violent state or did it belong in that love state and i think that's you know one of the ultimate questions that so many people have and the more i studied the ancient text the more i found that the natural state of a human from their their perspective not a darwinian perspective like we have today, but a perspective on looking at how human beings are in designed in this image of perfection and that we are, instead of being just an animal, we're actually an energetic viewpoint of perfection. We have within us this advanced state of energetic systems called the chakra systems, which are based exactly on the seven colors of the visible light spectrum, meaning that we, if we can obtain these certain higher vibrational states of energy and reach on what was known as kundalini, this crown chakra of our highest state of energy, we can literally become like gods and we could become these incredible beings that are spoken about all throughout history. Individuals like Krishna and um, Hermes and many others who have achieved a certain state. That's the state we're supposed to be in. That's what they say all along is that the real trick here and the real cruel, the real cruel trick that's being played here based on a lot of very creative things that happen out of the, out of Babylon with the Talmuds there, and then moving into the Roman empire and a lot of other things since then, we, t we turn into this, this reality where we're being convinced that we are that violent dog, whereas we've never been that violent dog all along. And we're just been conditioned into that mentality all the whole time. Where's my proof behind that? Some are saying, what? Okay, well, where's the proof? In most cases, look at indigenous cultures that are isolated around the world. Take some of the indigenous cultures that are still in the rainforest of, of um, South America, in Brazil. Now, in some cases, there obviously have been cultures that get into conflict. I recognize that. But if there was a culture like we find today that ends up being very, very isolated, and doesn't have any influences from others, what does that culture end up turning into with no influences, just being in nature? You find if you were to get in one of those canoes and silently make your way out, you know, into the vast reaches of the jungle and find one of those cultures and you're able to know their language and you are somehow able to interact with them to let them know that you've come in a peaceful way, you would find that that culture would be in perfect harmony with nature and, and love. They would, they would have no violence in their society. They would have all realized the silliness and juvenileness of acting in a certain way. And they would have realized that you don't waste things in nature. 
you, you develop in a balanced way where you all contribute something to society and you all play off of the things that you, the, the talents and the things that you, you do well. And I think that that's the state of what humanity has, is, is supposed to be all along. Not necessarily living out in the middle of the jungle, but being in a state where we have our emotional love side of what makes us positive as this light being of our chakras. If we live in that state as our identity, then quickly all of these, these distractions and things that make us feel like we're, we're not really what we are, they, they sort of dissolve and disappear all around us. And we realize that we've been tricked all along and that we're really this light being of the cosmos that comes from stardust from all over the universe. Wonderful, man. Thank you so much for sharing with us your understanding about true nature and how it is vital and important for all of us to get a reminder about that. That particular understanding uh, that we're all one big human family inspires us to create an international conference called Society of the Last Chance that took place on May 11, 2019, and was joining by thousands of people from around the world via live broadcast. And uh, this conference has led us to conclusion that the main problem of contemporary civilization is a consumer way of living, consumer way of thinking, which is leading us to self-destruction. And um, while the one way out of the current situation, current dead end situation is the change of the vector of the development of our civilization from a consumer to a creative, to a peaceful, but only by like peaceful means definitely, right? And today we understand that in order for us to build something new, people need to get together. So we need to be all united by one goal. And already there are thousands of people that united around that idea of building creative society, the model of the society in which every single person on earth can live happily and comfortably. And right now I would like to use this opportunity and ask this question to you, Matt, how you envision such a model of a society, what that means for you? Yeah, I think that those blueprints are, you know, very evident in the things I mentioned, like if we were to take things like the, the 40, let's say we were to design a culture around the 42 laws of Mott. Mott was an ancient goddess of Egypt. There was a consort of Thoth. If we were able to take those laws and directly apply them into our society, we would realize that some of those core values exist, but most of them are, are, are missing or they're very corrupted versions of themselves. It, it all comes down to this idea of creating a society that realizes first and foremost what defines them as their existence here. That's the most important thing that needs to first be brought to the surface. And I think that under your foundations of a creative society, I would, that's number one to me is looking at the value of a human life and what defines us and to have that be evident early on from the very beginning. If you had a child that was taught two different sides, that they're just an animal and they can do whatever they want and nothing matters, there's no consequences to their actions and that they're not part of something, something great, they're not gonna have a need to care. That perspective has already been woven into them that they don't really matter that they're just they're there to maybe just procreate and then die and that's it whereas this other side if that child is raised to go out at night and stare into the cosmos and perceive their existence in the universe and taught about these different states of consciousness that it, that can be obtained if you act a certain way and you have a certain mentality that child has a completely different perspective of what what they can accomplish and what they're part of. And so I think as a society, if you, if you take that as a whole and you take these ancient values and you apply them, it's not that I'm looking for a society that has no money and everyone just sits around and doesn't do anything. I want to just like stamp that out right away. That's not what I mean. And because where we are right now, right now is the complete opposite. People work the majority of their entire life, but not in a way where they're necessarily contributing to something that they have an actual hand in. It's more of like a, being a cog in a giant system. 
where you're essentially like giving up your energy just for the purposes of this giant system. And that system is, a, like you said, is a consumer materialistic empire of um, materialism and war. It is something where it's acquiring massive amounts of resources to dominate over one another. It's this conquistador mentality that hasn't really changed in thousands of years. And we just have, are tricking ourselves into thinking that it's different, but it really isn't. But what is changing is the mentalities of people all around the world. People are starting to get back out into nature again and understand that when they disconnect themselves from, from being bombarded by wireless signals and concrete jungles and you know all kinds of loud noises, they can quiet their mind. They can connect with a different energetic state and they feel different. And so what happens right now is on a weekend up where I live, the highways are all clogged with people right now, all heading up to the mountains because they all realize that, hey, we're living in this, this world where we have to work this dead end job, but we have this free time. Let's go you know, seek that other side that we're, that, we're, that we're looking for. Now, how would you make that work as a society though, right? How would you convince, how would you motivate people to want to do something that's not just hang around and, you know, chatting and laying in a pool. You know, how could you do that? Well, you would have to have them fundamentally understand that, first of all, what we're doing is part of our society, the growth of our society, right? You know, Jack right down the road, he's an, he's an incredible farmer. He's growing all these crops and vegetables, whereas Sarah right next to her, she's, you know, quantum physicist and then you know john right next to him he's he's a great painter you know people have all these qualities within them that hobbies that they consider that you know if you ask someone what what they do most people would just tell you what their job is but what if if, if you really ask someone what they're what they're passionate about and like what they are besides their job people will be like well i i love to sail i love to paint i love to make make music I love to write, you know, I love to um, understand complex mathematical problems. Those are the kinds of basic um, foundation qualities of a society that could be encouraged if we had a system where not based on competing with one another on a nationalistic scale, where armies then are formed and fight one another because we're made to believe we're all separate and different and, and there's something that we're all fighting against. I'm in complete favor of having more of a system where gradually our world can realize that we're all part of the same thing, the same outcome. You know, where does the human species go? And if you had every gifted mind and everyone in the world was realizing that they're all part of contributing to that, money didn't exist so that there'd be no greed or people, you know, that farmer would go out and till his crops because he knows that he's playing a role. He's growing those crops. And if he sits back and doesn't do anything, they're going to die. Just like the person who is, has this musical instrument next to them that could create beautiful music. If they, don't, if they decide not to play that instrument, that'll never be created. We are these creative conscious beings here that our purpose is to take ideas and manifest them into a certain kind of reality. Into a certain reality where we take the, the gifts that we truly have, which are far more fantastic than most people even know. You know, we have all of these abilities where the ancients talk about when you go into deep meditative states and you quiet your mind, you can leave the third dimension of our reality and enter into other dimensions of awareness where time is no longer linear and you can reach higher states of energy. It, that might sound, sound crazy to people until they start to apply some of these ancient teachings into their life. And they, they take these, these lessons and they realize that we as a humanity as a whole has the potential to be so much more than we are. And it almost hurts my heart to see what we become. So many people walking down the street, com completely sad and depressed because they live in these empty lives. You know, we don't deserve that. We deserve to realize the, um, the infiniteness of our consciousness and what we could become and, and our, our contributing um, decisions that lead to this rippling effect of, everything that can form our timeline. That's what I'm, I think is really makes me, me passionate about doing this. Matt, yeah. thank you so much. Um, 
I know we're, we're running short on time here, but we would really love to show you and the audience uh, a few of our foundational principles that are found here. And Marina's going to go ahead and introduce that to you. And I hope you don't mind. Sure, absolutely. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Jason. So um, the basis for uh, building such a society, there are eight foundation of the creative society, which are mentioned in our article. You can read it on allatraunite.com website. And these uh, eight foundation were formed as a result of thousands of interviews that we took around the globe, like more than 180 countries participated in this research. And um, right now I will ask uh, technical support to play a short video with this eight foundation. And later I would like to hear your reflection on this foundation. Why do you think it is important to implement them right now and how the world will change? Absolutely. Those are fantastic. Um, I've, I've read through those and I think they mimic a lot of the core values of what some of the ancient cultures were, were talking about. It's, it's like a blueprint for how to create a society that doesn't become corrupted by its own moral structure. And I think it starts with when I remember being, being a kid in, in you know, middle school, high school, and seeing how this aspect of what makes us who we really are, you know, creativity and imagination and the potential of what we what we are when we're young in many ways i think there's a very clever system that's been created deliberately here to stamp that out because those types of people tend to ask a lot of questions and not want to conform and it's this aspect of creating a conformed society that is just about productivity for certain aspects of productivity not productivity of knowledge and moving forward in that sense but more of just a productivity for wealth and I think that those values, if they were instilled on our society, would transform us into becoming productive in an energetic and knowledge basis. And I think that people, it, it would be amazing to how many people would res, uh, respond to that in a way where they would be, they would, it would change their lives if they, if they could exist in a place where the values of our, of our structure were not based on um, people being, you know, often quite cruel to one another and just trying to be better than everyone else. Whereas it's not, it's good to have a friendly competition to be the best you can, but it's more about like a collaborative group of all encouraging each other to be the best you can. So I really do find, I think that those values are incredibly important. Thank you so much. Uh, beautifully said. Um, and I think Anastasia is going to ask you about the ones that you like the most. Uh, before we wrap things up. And then I would like to tie back what you said where you were speaking about the intrinsic motivation of love and how one can contribute to society and tie that all in before we go. Thank you again, Matt. Yeah, Matt, you expressed the great interest on discussion of three foundations, which is value of human life, human freedom, and transparency and openness of information. Could you please uh, tell us why they are important for you? As I alluded to before and, and briefly spoke about, I think the, the first place we need to look at is there are foundations that are important, but they don't necessarily belong first. You have to create a foundation with certain hierarchical system. A foundation means you have to have a certain value structure that is of the most importance in a certain order. Because if you don't do that, then it won't really make as much logical sense and it won't work as well. For instance, in the way that I've, as I said before, we need to first redefine how we view ourselves in order for everything else to then trickle and fall into place. Once we were are to show the value of a human life and merciless as war, wars fought for banking corporations and companies, if we can just rid all that stuff from us, all that darkness, and get to a place where the human life is truly valued for what it is, 
a, a being of light in the cosmos. You don't just willing, you don't throw one of those aside like it's meaningless. It's it's almost like we're it's in many ways we're treated like we're just some expendable livestock. That's and that's not what we are. We need to redefine the a human life and how important it is. And then number two, human freedom and, and choice. We may think that we live in a world of free will, but in many ways, the laws that have been created here constrain us from actually having free will because we have certain means that are put in place where we have to to survive, pay our taxes and be able to eat and, and survive. That means that we have to play the system. We have to play this game that's here. And that automatically prevents free will from really having the effect that it truly is supposed to have, which means... What if someone wanted to become an archaeologist or something, say, and they wanted to go visit some place in the, in, around the world and study there? Could they? Maybe if they had a certain amount of money in their life, maybe a family member, they just happen to be lucky enough to have that in their life to allow them to do that. But in most cases, people don't have free will. They can't just make choices and do them. You, And some would say, well, Matt, what about earning, you know, and working hard for something. That's true. But we need to have a system where people have the opportunities to do things that can enhance them rather than having almost like a caste system, a modern caste system based on status and wealth in, in, in our world. Whereas we've really become a corrupted society where there, it really is an equal opportunity for everybody. I think that that's what needs to change is this entire unbalanced part of our society. And then the third, the third one is number four, which is the transparency of information and truth. We live in an age of complete deception and inversion. So many of the ancient symbols and the knowledge that they, they passed along not only became hidden, but it became completely mixed up and turned around into what is in many cases its opposite value. I, I, have a, I talk a lot about things like the eagle and the serpent and what those used to represent. And today, people think the serpent is this evil thing and the eagle is this symbol of freedom and peace, whereas every conquering empire in the last several thousand years has seamlessly shown this eagle on its flag and crest, whereas ancient civilizations throughout history that focused on energy had the symbol of the serpent. We've been taught the complete opposite of what's really true, to hide and that what, what is actually connecting to what I think is higher states of consciousness and energy and understanding what our, our ancestors knew all along. So I think if we were to have those three foundations, you know, revealed and taught, everything else would fall in place after that. Um, so that, that's how I see, um, that's what I see as being the most important of those foundations to lay down. Yeah, that's a terrific answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. And uh, as you can see, none of us couldn't agree more with what you have said so far. Um, and I'd just like to highlight something for everyone that has listened to this so far, is Matt has discussed that uh, the way that we perceive ourselves is directly reflected in how we associate ourselves with society. And that's about being self-responsible and taking action and doing what makes you, you happy yet it can't uh, impede upon someone else's uh, happiness, okay? Um, and that has been found all throughout ancient history. Also, Matt, you have discussed just now with our audience about uh, certain signs and symbols. And for those that read your books, that follow you, that listen to these things, there's an interesting book called the Alatra book, in um, which they can learn a lot more about those signs and symbols and bridge those uh, gaps of knowledge that they're looking for. Um, because I'd like to highlight what you said in your book, uh, The Stage of Time. I'd like to be open uh, about all possibilities uh, in pursuit of new information, you know, and I really think that uh, captures a way a person should take self-responsibility and not be closed-minded to new incoming sources of information. Thank you. Um, we're, thank you, thank you. We're gonna wrap things up now. Um, on September 13th, uh, 2020, we're going to have a conference on the Kaleidoscope Effects. It's a new project uh, started by participants all over the world of uh, lay people, educated people, passionate people, you name it. Um, 
it's also going to be broadcasted in multiple languages. I think something like 10 or 12 languages. Um, and the topic we're going to discuss that I'd like to invite you and anyone else who would like to participate in this is we're going to discuss Atlantis plain and openly. Uh, we're going to discuss these hierarchies, uh, these structures that were discovered. We're going to discuss the cultures and the technology they used um, around those timelines and really pursue information. Uh, because going back a little further, you had brought up, uh, and this is, this is for anyone who's interested in participating, we have found a lot of technology during World War II actually comes uh, from the Atlanteans. Uh, that was found in different scrolls, texts, cuneiforms, uh, uh, Tamil writing, Sanskrit writing, you name it, um, was found, reused, and then no one, no one discusses it. Um, so we would like to cordially invite you to that and anyone who uh, watches your programs. Also, we, we, we commit to inviting one more person. Uh, if you can, please, will you tell us who you would like to invite to speak with us and discuss some interesting topics, um, whoever that may be within your circle of friends or who you would like to see on here, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll see if Billy Carson is available. I think he'd be great for this discussion. Wow. Thank that's... you so much, Matt. Wow. And we welcome Billy Carson, please. Uh, Anastasia is going to close up and uh, give the final word. Thank you all so much for joining us. This has been a wonderful interview with Matt. Matt, thank you. Yeah, Most thank welcome. you very much, Matt. Thank it you. is amazing. We really appreciate all your discoveries, what you are sharing and your attitude. And like, to me, it is, you're talking that we are collecting seeds that then we were talking about peaceful civilizations. But it this talk, it was talk about ancient history, but I see how this history is related to us, that it's about us, about our society and the choices we are making. And these things what you're talking, that it was a peaceful societies and how they could be built, they given hope. And I think from this point, everything can be changed because in the end of the day, what we leave behind is what what not engraved into the stone. It's what is woven in anyone's life. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Matt. It was a pleasure to have you here. Thanks a lot. It was a great discussion. Thanks so much for having me on. Until next time.